<laughs> Dr. Jen, welcome to Zenny 62 Live. It is an honor to have you. I cannot say enough how honor, much of an honor it is to have the NFL's first female coach. And while I'm uh, introducing you, I'm going to actually, because I'm using YouTube Live Mobile, I'm going to activate the landing page. It's actually already active, but I'm going to calibrate it. It only takes a second. But I do this. I use YouTube Live Mobile because it's better than the desktop version by by millions and and by miles. So um, and then allows me to immediately put this out once again on social media, like I'm doing, and um, and uh, like that, just to announce to everybody that we're on and uh, hashtag NFL, which will also go out automatically there. And there that goes. And give it a thumbs up here. And I am going to now put, go over to here to you, right there. And um, Dr. Jen, welcome. Yes. Hey, so yeah, Play Big is uh, 228 pages of really your life story, you know, to me. And uh, I'm curious to know, what was the, first of all, congratulations on everything you've done. You have a lot of firsts. And I'm honored to say I met you on Radio Row at Super Bowl, thanks to Be our mutual friend, Beth Silverberg, who's just an yeah. awesome person. And um, what what was the aha moment where you saw it, said, just dog on it, I'm gonna write a book, you know? Um, you know, having such a, a crazy awesome career in women's football where I knew things were special I had kept some different journals and I always wanted to write a book um, I just didn't really know it was going to be possible and after having spent time in the NFL there were just a lot of people who wanted to know the story and so um, it was like okay this is time and this is time to be able to really capture what's been such a positive story. And I I feel like, especially now, um, it's time for, for good, positive things. And thankfully, the timing was aligned because um, we did a compressed publishing cycle. So from essentially agreeing to publish the book to the time it hit the shelves, it was only a year. Wow. which is really fast yeah. in book time. Um, but I think it was perfect timing considering everything that's going on right now. Okay, I couldn't agree more. Hey, um, I'm curious to know, because I, as, I, as I said, you, uh, Cam Newton made a statement last week, which almost was a setup for your book. <laughs> and uh, I've interviewed Cam twice. I'm, you undoubtedly know him much better than I do. What was, what was your reaction to what you heard him say. And I've heard you talk about this before, but I like, but there's a different spin on it I had, so I wanted to share that with you, you know? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's actually not humorous. Um, but the timing was curious, I guess is the best way to say it. And um, I was on Good Morning America that morning and doing other interviews that day. So I was really wrapped up and hadn't heard about it. And um, actually found out about it because a couple of reporters reached out almost simultaneously. Wow. And I was like, uh, this isn't good. You know, have you heard about this? And would you make a statement? And I was like, my gut reaction was just, okay, guys, first of all, realize Cam is a friend. And Cam has been incredibly outspoken and a great supporter of mine since the day we met. So if you're looking for somebody to have something negative to say, it's not me. I will watch it. I will consider it. But I want you to know right off the jump that doesn't speak to the man that I know. And so it took me um, a little bit to just watch and consider. And, I, and when I watched it, I was like, you know, he almost looked confused mm -hmm. a little bit. It was like the question didn't hit home. And I was talking to a friend of mine later and I was like, I was like, Cam, just that's not right. Like, I don't, that's not the guy I know. He's been interviewed by how many women, mm -hmm. right? Like, right, right. Yeah. Hundreds. 
yeah. or more, right, over yeah. the course of his career, and this has never come out, so this is out of character. So what was it about this particular interview? And I was like, you know, he kind of almost even paused over the question that was being asked, and I was like, you know, it was like when she asked about the physicality of the routes that they were running, and I was like, wait a minute. Nobody actually asks about physicality of route. I was like, thinking the same thing. <laughs> like, you don't really run a route with physicality. You run it with precision, with speed, with accuracy, with a whole lot of things. But you don't run it with physicality. You might run the ball after you catch it with physicality. You Your yards after catch could be credited to running with the ball in your hand with extended physicality and, you know, beating a defender or two and so it almost seemed like when I went back and just thought about it and paused that like he kind of was like wait a minute and and he phrased it wrong Mm -hmm. but I don't think it was meant to be a malicious statement and he has always been completely phenomenal with respect to my career and even advocating on my behalf so I know it's not a problem with women per se. No, and it's funny because when I first heard it, I thought honestly that he was thinking about it. Maybe as I was thinking about it, more like okay, routes and maybe he was being playful, right? And because of the way she put the physicality part, and so it kind of actually went over my, you know, this doesn't say much for me, but it went over my head. And then mm-hmm. I thought about it. I said, okay, I can see that, but. Also, there's so many women I know, like yourself and others, who know how to draw football plays that it, it just didn't, it was lost to me. What I thought about was, I remember when I interviewed Cam, and I was at the Super Bowl where I met you, and I was talking about how I was the first person that talked to him at the NFL draft, and he goes, oh, you were trying to steal my thunder, huh? So I, was, I thought it was kind of like, you know how he is, right? So he is, <laughs> and he's a very, he's a super competitive, very playful energetic person Mm -hmm. and if you know cam you know there's not one ounce of any bad spirit in him it it just doesn't even exist right right he is um he is exactly who he is and he is you know when he's on it's like he elevates everyone around him but we've seen it before He also doesn't necessarily have a filter when things go bad. Like, you know, you can see he takes it very personal and to heart. And he doesn't have a poker face. And maybe more time in the league, he'll he'll develop that, you know, as, as I heard some people say, well, he should know better. He was being interviewed. It's like, of course, we all know that intellectually. Mm -hmm. But emotion is a very different thing and I would just hope that people would realize that in everything I know about him and I've known him for a number of years now there's not one ounce of mean in Cam Newton right like he is enthusiastic and competitive and serious and passionate and we've played kickball together many times and he encouraged his team with spirit fingers (laughs) <laughs> nice, nice. You know, uh, yeah, like yeah. He just fundamentally mm-hmm. is a great guy, mm-hmm. and um, it was hard for me as a friend to see, um, obviously a statement that just taken by itself on its face is not the right thing to say, but it doesn't mean he is a bad person, right? Absolutely, and, right. You know, and and the caution I would give anyone is you know let's all be really human and really honest with the fact that if any one of our lives was put and it was essentially like the low light reel of our life Mm -hmm. right 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 how good would any of us look well said completely well said you know something that strikes me about play big talking about cam newton is the number of players who are extremely respectful of you and i think of the coach that you went to when you wanted to put the notes in the locker and um i'm trying to tell you part of the story because i want people to read the book but 
the person you when you went to the man you said you know you you, you said hey and he said uh what's up coach it wasn't dr jenner it was what's up coach that's what struck me i mean that was the norm right i mean it seemed like everyone just really took you as coach jim mm -hmm. right coach the, the coach of the linebacker the inside linebacker coach right yeah and they did and um you know one of the things i i like to encourage people to realize is you know there are moments that things don't come out right right like you know i remember we were in um in training camp at one point and it, it's a grind it is you know they're super long days and you're together all the time and we probably don't look good per act perfectly right maybe don't smell good at times but we're <laughs> in the trenches together right and and it's all love and one of the guys was just he was having a rough day and he was like man you know training camp it's such a grind and he was like no woman could do this. And I'm sitting right there and I just looked at him. I was like, dude, really? Like, you said that out loud. Yeah, and he right. just looked at me and he was like, oh, you don't count. You're one of us. And that was simply the best compliment he could give because it wasn't the girl coach. It was, you're just one of us. We're, we're the same. And um, to me, I think that's the beauty of like where we can get to through diversity mm -hmm. when we have an understanding of a common goal. It's like the things that people see on the outside that would divide us, like we don't even look at it that way. And if somebody looked at it from the outside um, and was looking to, you know, catch a statement out of context, maybe some of the things would seem wrong, mm -hmm. but we have such a good understanding in those trenches that we know better. And, um, you know, that that's part of what I wanted people to see when they read that book is that ultimately we were more the same than we were different. You know, we were all football players. And, and that was something that the guys made very clear is that, like, when I got there, they were like, oh, man, Coach Jim, we watched your highlight reel, right? Like, <laughs> you were a beast off the edge, right? And mm -hmm. um, to me, that's the ultimate sign of respect as athletes, right? When we invest ourselves to know somebody, mm -hmm. right? When mm -hmm. we respect their game. I don't care if they're in the same sport or whatever. When we're like, damn, all right, mm -hmm. you know? And and those guys invested their time in me before I even got there. You um, also played linebacker, and I'm curious to know what was it about being a line. Let me ask this from an entirely other perspective. What's your favorite defense to coach? And I, I say this because I'll, I'll 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 say why. I really have an issue with the three four. Okay, I hate the bubble area. <laughs> And I love the 4-3, and Ray Lewis made a crack. I mean, I think Ray Lewis made a crack about the playing in 3-4, but he didn't quite go all the way, and I got after him a few years ago when I was writing with the Chronicle, and I said, why don't you just say straight out the 4-3 is great and 3-4 sucks? You know, but what's your... I mean, straighten me out if you think that I'm wrong. Yeah. I think either defense can be great, mm -hmm. but you really have to scheme it based on your athletes. Mm -hmm. um, I was an edge rusher. Mm -hmm. most of my career. Mm -hmm. So I was an outside contained person, um, fast and fearless off the inch and hard to stop, mm -hmm. which, you know, at times actually had me as a defensive lineman, um, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at five foot two, that's kind of hard to justify, but I was also mm -hmm. really hard to stop. See, so, so you're, you're almost Elmer Stumer, Dumerville, right? <laughs> but, you know, a 4-3 and a 3-4 aren't that different depending on the stunts that you run. Mm -hmm. It's just the personnel that you keep. Mm -hmm. And so you have to realize and not get attached to one versus the other mm -hmm. as much as which one works best for the players that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, in a 3-4, you really need to get, you need to have somebody who can, um, who can dominate both A-gaps which is 
tough to do, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. you have to be able to play both A's mm -hmm. and you have to be, you have to have essentially linemen who are willing to take the O linemen and not necessarily always be the penetrators mm -hmm. and be willing to sacrifice themselves so that the linebackers make their play, mm -hmm. which, you know, is different from setting the defensive linemen as your rush guys. Mm -hmm. And you can do either one from either position. So you, it really has to do more with how you use your players mm -hmm. and what stunts you write off it than just one defense or the other. We can help my viewers with this. We're uh, a lot of Raider fans and concerned about their defense, but a number of them want to sack the defensive coordinator, Ken Norton Jr. I explained that Ken Norton is really doing the head coach's bidding. So how should we extend, you know, understand the role of the defensive coordinator here? Well, I mean, each team is a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? And, and they always are because, um, you know, and depending on what your philosophy of your head coach is, right, mm -hmm. and which side of the ball he favors, right? If you have a super heavy, like for me, okay, mm -hmm. let's just, I'll, I'll make it personal. Mm -hmm. If I was a head coach, right, like I was with the Australian women's national team over the summer. Right. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But my offensive coordinator mm -hmm. didn't really have to worry about me stepping on his toes at all because I'm a defensive girl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to have a whole lot more autonomy because I expect him to be a whole lot better than me at offense because if he's not, we're in big trouble, right? Right. Because I'm a defensive girl. Right. Whereas my defensive coordinator and I had to be much more in sync because I'm going to be a lot more hands-on and active um, in terms of the defense because that's my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. So with any team, you have to have that understanding first and foremost is like, look at not only your coordinators, but where your head coach's preferences or his attention is, um, and then realize that if he's a defensive guy, right, like for me, mm -hmm. that the defense rests a lot more on me mm -hmm. and him, whereas the offense would be like, you know, if we were terrible, right. you know, that guy's got a lot more autonomy. Right. Uh, a number of people have questions here. I'm going to uh, yeah. pick this one. And... This person, I'm going to take both of their comments and combine them into one. This person's concerned that the media tends to view black quarterbacks as different from white ones. This is a specific media one. Uh, is that your view? What's the view? I mean, what do you think about that? And this has to do with Cam Newton and other you know, quarterbacks as well. And uh, I mean, I could say a lot about that, but I want this to be your platform. So anyway, this is about, you know, but what, do you, what's your, what are your thoughts about that? My question would be, first and foremost, in what respect? Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. In what respect are they viewed differently? And I think this person, let me go back to read this person. He said, uh, um, perhaps he'll, he'll clarify that now that he's heard it. I'll say for me, I've seen the arc change because uh, mm -hmm. I've covered the NFL draft, you know. And, but I know that, like, for example, one person I won't mention said that Cam Newton had no heart, and we got after him. And that was before Cam was drafted. I think you know what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, is it that a lot of a lot of views seem to have changed? I mean, have you thought, or do you think we still have a long way to go? Um, you know, the quarterback position, first and foremost, has to be your leader. Mm -hmm. And there are many different types of leaders, okay? In the history of the NFL... African-American quarterbacks have traditionally been underestimated. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I think we're getting better about it? Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you've had so many great examples that you can't deny that it's an athleticism, intellectualism, leader qualities, all of those things. Now, can let's tap into my dissertation research and I, I, will, I will put on my doctor hat for a mm -hmm. second. Mm-hmm. 
my doctoral research was on the NFL's use of the Wonder Lake and player selection, which is the intelligence test right. given at the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. Now, historically in our society, you know as well as I do, mm -hmm. intelligence tests were used for discrimination purposes. Yes. Right? Yes. Whether it was immigrant purposes mm -hmm. or, you know, people trying to come up in this world, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Immigrants say, for example, don't speak English. Well, and we give them a test that's in English, and then we say that they're stupid. No, they can't read it, mm -hmm. but they might be very smart in another setting. So in in the history of intelligence tests, unfortunately, they, they've been found to be very biased. Mm -hmm. okay? Yes. So my research on the Wonderlic test said, and it's the most comprehensive research done to date with respect to the impact of the Wonderlic test on prediction of performance and um, the relationship to selection. Mm -hmm. So number one, the first question would be, do teams look at, at Wonderlic tests? Yes, they do. Statistically significantly, um, quarterbacks with higher Wonderlic scores, which equate to higher IQ, mm -hmm. are drafted earlier. Number one. Number two, quarterbacks with higher Wonderlic scores in their rookie year, which we would assume that would mean they picked up the playbook faster, actually are significantly worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, they increased faster, but in year 4.2, they were no better. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're, play we're paying athletes who got higher Wonderlic scores more money. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And yet their performance is not better. Hmm. Okay. Now, traditionally from a socioeconomic perspective, if you look at intelligence tests, if you were brought up with privilege, you will be more likely to do better on a standardized test. Right. Because it, it taps into things like words that no one uses in society. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what it means is, Yes, intellectually speaking, on this measure, okay, they're doing better and they are being selected faster mm -hmm. and earlier, which means more money, mm -hmm. but they don't perform better, okay? Right. Now, what does that say? That says, and all of us know if you've been in football, you know you have to be very smart to be very good, Right. okay? Mm -hmm. Right? You mm -hmm. have to be brilliant. You have to be brilliant in football. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to be brilliant as would be measured by the Wonderlic score, which is essentially a short form of the SAT. Right. Right? Could you predict your quarterback success on the SAT? No, no. Not at all. Not at all. Right. Because actually, if you told me either you can study for the SAT or you can study your playbook and make millions of dollars, guess what I'm going to study? Use <laughs> the playbook right. and make millions. <laughs> right. 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 So there is a very big difference between necessarily like standardized test IQ and football IQ. Mm -hmm. And yet in the history of the league, we were looking more at this is what a good quarterback is, would be measured by this standard. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that true football intelligence isn't measured by those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means our perception has changed. And I think the belief in what football intelligence is mm -hmm. and who are brilliant football players and leaders has gotten better. Right. Because you're seeing yeah. the quarterback dynamic has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at the makeup of quarterbacks in the NFL now relative to any period in history. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at predominantly white guys or are we looking at pre predominantly African Americans? Yeah, I in I think of Deshaun Watson, you know, in right. that in that context and a comment that an announcer made on I think it was Sunday night football where the person observed Deshaun Watson's instincts and I'm thinking, you know, it's not instincts. Those are the same moves he made at Clemson. He was trained. It's not it's he didn't just like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's football IQ, it's brilliance in an application. Yeah. Can we mm -hmm. can see it play out in football, right? Because we have game tape. Mm -hmm. 
right? Right. Really thin application could be in a whole lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. It could be in accounting. It could be in marketing. It could be in business. We don't have game tape on those. Right. 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 We're seeing reaction and action combined in real time, which is intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's brilliance. It's being able to recognize that you have two high safeties as opposed to one and knowing that when you have two high safeties your weakness is in the middle Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right that's right as opposed to it's a cover three and you better not go in the middle because you're going right in your safety's hands right all of those things are brilliant Mm -hmm. but we didn't really know how to put that in words in the past and i think as we see it more and more you know Mm -hmm. and we look at guys who were brilliant in the history of the NFL as quarterbacks. Like, I can't think of a better example than Warren Moon. Right. Right. Then we start to see that the perceptions have to change. Mm-hmm. And I think they have definitely gotten, thankfully, um, more colorblind. Yes. Meaning, yes. talent is talent. Mm-hmm. And being able to read the defense is being able to read the defense. And it's not just equating it to like what Michael Vick was when they, he was obviously a physical specimen, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no doubt. But they didn't necessarily credit him with being a brilliant quarterback. Right. They would say right. he was just simply a mobile quarterback, right? And Absolutely. that was kind of the way that they justified it. Yeah, it was almost like his timing was off in, in terms of, the advent of the read option versus the advent of Michael Vick. And I kept thinking, man, if the two had lined up, you know, Super Bowl, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, um, one of my viewers wanted to know, I'm just going to ask this straight out. How do we get you back? I mean, you should need to be coaching in the NFL again. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, um, you really do. So what, what, because we have Niners have now have a, a, a female coach thanks to you know yes thanks to your uh, influence and success. Well, and Katie's a former teammate of mine, so I'm really happy for her. We played together on Team USA. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and we played against each other for many many years. She played for Kansas City, and I played for Dallas, so those were um, rival teams. So. Oh. You know, I'm honored that she's in the league now. To me, that's affirmation that, you know, what we did in Arizona was so successful. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of me being in the league, mm-hmm. you know, that's up to the coaches. Mm-hmm. And it really is. You know, it always is. Um, and it's up to making the right connections at the right time. How does it, and this goes back to play big, and my trying to grow my startup and my fears of approaching VCs. How did you, I'm just being honest, how did you, when did you get the point where you said, all right, I got to overcome this fear? Was it knowing what the fear was or adrenaline or, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you get over yourself is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Um, I think for everybody, it's, there's an intersection between want and fear. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. and sometimes want wins, and sometimes fear wins. Um, for me, you know, I never had the goal of, say, coaching in the NFL, because that wasn't something that was possible. It was something that I never could have dreamt of being a possibility, because there was nobody I could look at and say, "I want to be her. I want to do that." So I didn't have this master plan or this giant goal of I will be in the NFL one day, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, So it it wasn't the same as a lot of people have as like, you know, you're saying right now, like I have this master dream and I have to overcome the fear to get there. Right. 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 Um, That's that's a little bit different because you're looking at something that's actually possible, hmm. right? Or mm-hmm. been done. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and you're looking at yourself relative to that point. True. True. Okay. There was no point of comparison for me. Ah. So it wasn't the same. And, you know, 
I don't know if there was a point of comparison, if there was somebody that I looked at and I thought, you know, could I live up to her standard if I would have been brave enough to do it? Thankfully, I was the first. So um, I guess other people have to get over that for, you know, <laughs> um, for themselves. Um, but for me, my goal going in when I had that opportunity was to be the first and not the last. It was to be a very good lead blocker and to make sure that the door was opened further. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. So that other people could enter, even if it wasn't me. And I think that that's an important point because, um, because when you have, like for me, when that was my gauge of success, mm-hmm. right? Ensuring that the door was open. That was how I how I set the standard of success for myself. Yeah. This was the goal. That other women would have the opportunity because of what we did in Arizona. Okay? And so that means success is seeing Katie there. Even if it's not me there. Right? That's right. Whereas That's right. much more limited scope of success could have been, I have to stay in the NFL forever. And it has to be me leading the way all the time. And so it's hard and it's easy all at the same time. We're talking with Dr. Jim Welter, uh, author of the book, Life Lessons Play Big. I, I prefer to call it Life Lessons as opposed to Play Big. But, uh, and you continue our discussion. Uh, those of you who are on the chat, please uh, tweet this out and also put it on Facebook. I'm going to do that right now uh, for just a, a second. And uh, and while I'm doing this, uh, Doctor Jin, what what's the next step for you? I know it's right now it's pitching this book, but I ask because a buddy of mine wants to make your book into a movie, um, <laughs> and he wants to reach out to you. And I I, I said, you know, I think that would be a great idea. And uh, he's a, a minch uh, of a fellow named Rick Cohen, who's uh, a movie producer, and he, he found me on Facebook. We've known each other for years. And he found me on Facebook after he saw my announcement about your, you know, uh, about this uh, interview. And uh, I said, you know what, I'll ask. And in the middle of listening to you, I thought, why don't I just put it out there? Because, you know, Rick's doing great things in Hollywood and everything else. And uh, he really is a minch. <laughs> but have you ever, has anyone approached you about making a movie of your life? You know? Uh, yes. You know, th- thankfully... Um I think it is a movie that that needs to be made for a lot of reasons. Um, And it is a goal of mine. Um, I have been approached by a couple of people. And those are conversations I'm going to have. I have not had them yet because, as I've said, um, let me finish at least this first two weeks of getting the book out so that I can know enough to focus in on those conversations because I'm a very... Um, project oriented mind mm-hmm. right if I'm in this phase I'm going to be 100% dedicated to this part and then I want to be able to give that my 100% attention to be able to deep dive and really know the best options but it is a goal of mine I do I do believe this should be a made a movie um, for a number of reasons um, you know the stories of women playing football have yet to be told. Mm -hmm. And those are important stories. And, you know, also just how you transition from something like playing for a dollar a game to then becoming the first female to coach in the NFL, I think can uplift a lot of people, especially in the age when we have, you know, female stories hitting so close to home, you know, you look at Wonder Woman, you start to see heroes Mm -hmm. that are females. um, And this isn't fiction, it's reality. And to me, I think that's a cause for a lot of hope. So, I would love that. Is there, can we start a bidding war for the rights to write the script? (laughs) Uh, Okay, cool. I have a treatment idea. (laughs) Hear that, Rick Cohen? I got a treatment idea. (laughs) Hey, what did you realize about the NFL being inside of it 
that you didn't know before, and I'll explain what I mean. Uh, I've been associated with the league, as we talked about off camera, well, since, wow, 1993, and then really it's 1999 when I tried to bring Super Bowl to Oakland and all that, went to the NFL annual meeting, and it really, to me, is a lot like family, you know? But I was wondering what you thought about that, because you, you know people on a first-name basis, you have an entirely different view of them in the media picture. What do you think, you know? They are family. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I lovingly say I have um, the most wonderful, diverse family. Mm -hmm. It's my football family, um, and it's giant. It's women and men um, who I've played with, played against, coached with, coached against, been coached by domestically and abroad. And we are every make, model, shape, size, creed, color, you know, sexual orientation, religion, everything. Mm -hmm. And it's a big melting pot. And it doesn't work if everybody looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's what I love because we find our universe, unity in our diversity. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's just pause with that. We find our uni unity through our diversity. And that's what makes us beautiful and special. Amen. Amen. And if we in our country could do a whole lot more of that, we wouldn't be dealing with a lot of the problems that we are today. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that what I knew in women's football and then even in arena football was just the same or even more so <laughs> at the NFL level. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have now relationships that extend even past the Cardinals because, you know, I'll have guys all the time. They'll be like, oh, Coach Shane, you're family, right? Mm -hmm. You're a part of the family. Right, right. And they might be people I never met. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they talk to so-and-so who played for the Cardinals, and he said I was the real deal. So, you know, just know your family. Mm -hmm. And we got you. And, and it really is um, for somebody who grew up in a very small family, and I always wondered what it would be like to have a big family reunion. Mm -hmm. I get that all the time now. And I, and I love it. And there's, there's so much love. And there's also so much of a desire to set the standards not only with the team, but also within society as well. And, um, you know, I wish more people saw the beauty in that that I see all the time. Yeah, I couldn't have. I couldn't have said best. I think the the book really also brings that out too. Uh, what do you think of Bruce Arians, the coach? Because I, the guy's a Mitch. Those those hats kill me though. With the <laughs> but how okay, was he? How so was I have a great story. Yeah, okay. actually, the hats. Um, everyone that sold mm -hmm. the money that he raises goes to the Arians Family Foundation, mm -hmm. which um, advocates oh, which advocates for kids, their mm -hmm. casas. So child advocate services, and that's something his wife has been really passionate about and advocates for. Um, so they really help um, a lot of kids through what they do, and all the proceeds from those hats go to that. Um, I remember Bruce at one point telling me, he was like, you know, these hats just kill me now. I got to wear them all the time. Everybody expects it, but, you know, it helps the kids, <laughs> so it's a good thing. And um, But that's what I love about Bruce is, he is a what you see is what you get guy. Mm -hmm. There's no falseness in Bruce Arians at all. He is 100% authentic. I knew within five five minutes of meeting him that I would run through a wall for him. Wow. And I didn't understand the wall that he was going to have me run through at the time. Um, but it was funny because everything about him is, is very well thought out but it's also very um very genuine and very like he goes with his gut hmm. um like i remember talking to his wife chris and she is a hot ticket she really is she's brilliant and feisty and i think she's a little shorter than i am um so she might be like five foot but she has like um kind of spiky hair so hmm. She's probably about my same height with the hair. And, um, you know, I actually talked to Bruce about some of the things in my book because um, I wanted to make sure that 
I understood his perspective on some of the important decisions because to me, you know, Bruce bet his entire career on me. Yes. And I said to Chris at one point, I said, you know, I'm so glad that Bruce is allowing me to interview him because, you know, I tell people all the time that he risked his career on me. And she goes, oh, yeah, when he told me that, I told him he was crazy. Why are you going to bet your whole, you know, why are you going to bet your whole career on some girl? And she looked at me and she just smiled and she said, and yet that's what I love about my husband. Wow. He was smarter than I was. He had not one doubt when it came to you. He just knew it would work. And it was such an honest exchange. And that's, you know, that's the thing I would say about the whole Arians family is they will have an honest conversation with you and tell you, I had a reservation and you answered the question. It won't be like, oh, I had no doubt. No. You know, it, it's very honest and true and um for anybody who's seen a an interview with Bruce Arians and thought, oh, my gosh, he seems like a cool dude. No, no. He really is that cool a dude. Any, He's like that all the time, too. There's no pretense. Any contact with the Bidwell family? Because they seem like they really were great at laying the ground and then just sort of stepping out of the way and let, letting Coach Arians, you know, kind of... Uh, set the tone for you, you know, in a way where you weren't hampered. Am I, am I misreading yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, no, you are. Um, I mean, you know, ours, um, I think unless you're a, a select few, you, you meet them uh, sporadically, but um, my hat is off to the Bidwells for, you know, being willing to step into that decision and be willing to open the door for all women who cared about football. And, um, you know, it's not like I got to talk to Michael Bidwell every day, but when I did, he was, um, you know, just very supportive and, um, everything you could ask for. I'm getting, um, hammered with quite one question, which we talked about, but we didn't quite, uh, do you want to talk about this kneeling thing? Are you cool with that? Sure. Okay, cool. Uh, what do you think about the kneeling controversy? My thought, and I'll just, just explain where I'm coming from. I salute, but I'm also a pers person who's been victim of police brutality. And uh, I'll tell the story what happened. This was uh, foreshortened. Uh, came home one night in 2006 on the Bay Bridge. Guy was tailgating me. Make a long story short, um, I wanted him to get off my back, so I went over to Highway Patrol. I went in front of the cop to get his attention. They get off the bridge, they stop me. The guy that was tailgating goes by me at 85 miles per hour. He breathalyzes me, even though I wasn't really over the limit, he said I was. Puts me up like this in a handcuff, right? Says he's going to let me go, doesn't. And then as tears start rolling down my eyes because I realize what was going to happen, he takes my entire body and slams it on his patrol car. Okay. And then he wrote that I delayed arrest. So I was remanded for about two nights at Santa Rita in the Bay Area where I live, I live in Oakland. And we tried to get the guy fired. Me and my, my friend is the best criminal defense attorney in the Bay Area. Actually, one of the best in the country. And he did it gratis. So we tried to get the guy fired. So that's what happened to me. But I don't, you know, by, by say that because I understand what each and every year black NFL player is coming from. And it's from that context. And what are your thoughts about it? Yeah. Uh, number one, if, you know, if you read my book, mm -hmm. um, which you have, mm -hmm. um, for anybody who's watching, mm -hmm. buy the uh, book, buy the book, in there. <laughs> please. I know, I know you have, but mm -hmm. there's a story of one of my very best friends in the book. Her name's Alberta Fitcher Bryson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have talked about it many times. And every time I see her and we're together and we have played, we played for my entire Diamonds career together. Her daughters are my daughters, right? Like, I don't have kids of my own. Like, I am Auntie Jen to them. Um, we played in Sweden and in Finland. She's one of the best women I know on the face of this planet. And whenever we do anything, we kind of have a joke. It's like, hey, B, you better not, you know, I don't know if you want to be too close. You might get pulled over for being friends with the little white girl. Because... <laughs> 
she did get pulled over by a police officer one time and Mm -hmm. it was after we were at the same gas station and the cop essentially said you know well I saw you talking to that little white girl and I guess in his eyes it looked wrong or suspicious in some way and I told this story in my book because you know the point of it was what he didn't see is we were family right and that football for so many of us is the great equalizer, right? Yes. You know, yes. you you meet people and you play with people and you, um, you know, you block for or um, get tackled by people of every every make and model in society, and and you don't see color, right? right? Like right. we don't see color, and we saw purple. Right? That's what right. we saw. At that mm-hmm. time, we were the Dallas Diamonds, and that's what we were. Mm-hmm. And we bled the same color blood, and it was diamonds purple. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't have thought anything else, but this is my sister. And it breaks my heart to know that there are people in this world who don't see that. Who don't see that a person is a person. Mm-hmm. And you know what? There are great people... And there are terrible people of every skin color. Mm -hmm. There Mm -hmm. are, you know, there are jerks in every make, model, you know, it doesn't matter. A jerk is a jerk. Yep. Yep. But it doesn't come with a skin color attached. It doesn't come with a socioeconomic status or a certain car or haircut or, you know, cut of jeans. It, It doesn't come defined like that. So to know that somebody is going to be targeted for something that's at the surface, not at the core, breaks my heart Mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And it takes an immense amount of bravery in our society to stand up or to take a knee for what you believe in, regardless, okay? Whether you agree with the the protests Mm -hmm. Or you don't. Mm -hmm. It's brave to take a stand or to take a knee. Now, the problem is that now we have been challenged Mm -hmm. to be divided around what it means and what we're standing for or kneeling for and who it's disrespecting. There's no disrespect in protesting, right? Right. We, we as Americans, we champion free speech. We say that's the flag that we fly, mm-hmm. is that we embrace individuality. We are the United States of America, taking individual states of humanity and uniting them under one flag, mm-hmm. okay? And that's supposed to be the thing that makes us great, which in that means that we love and respect protest. We're not protesting the military. It's not protesting the flag. It's protesting injustice. Right. However, the point that we've gotten because of the challenges that have come from a very high level Mm -hmm. have been you either take a knee for your race or you stand for your country. Right. Right. And that's not fair because that's not an either or scenario. And now it's a matter of if you take a stand, right, Mm -hmm. by taking a knee, Mm -hmm. you're anti your country and you should be fired. Well, now you're just challenging the manhood or womanhood or willingness to have a belief. Mm-hmm. You're not even challenging what is meant to be challenged, right? You're going towards the core of our society and just essentially throwing dirt in somebody's face and saying, you know, let's fight. Yeah. And that to me is what's so terribly sad because no one should be asked to make the choice between taking a knee or taking a stand for what you believe in and actually, you know, being a patriot in your country or being able 
to be employed. And it just, there's no good way out of this fight. Right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's no, there's no good answer. Right? It's, you know, we have a president who has dug his heels into the sand Mm -hmm. and has demonized everybody who won't just allow him to dictate what they do. Mm -hmm. And now you have people who before wouldn't have taken a knee because they were conflicted about the flag, who are now taking a knee because they just feel threatened. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, they essentially feel like they would be sellouts mm-hmm. if they don't take a knee. Mm-hmm. And who agrees with that dichotomy? Like, there's nothing but manipulation that's going on right now, and it's terrible. And as coaches... Right? Mm -hmm. As coaches, you hear them talk about, we talk about two things that are essential to a team. Number one, it's unity. And number two, it's minimizing distraction. Right. Right. And I get the impression, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And this is, this is creating both chaos and distraction Mm -hmm. and disharmony. So it's ripping people apart in a sport that is fundamentally founded on the need for diversity as a strength. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's what makes it so tough. I was going to say, I got the impression I saw Mike Tomlin at this first press conference, and he was, it seemed to me, visibly upset that this was being brought to them and making them to see him out to be people they weren't. He, you know, And I get the impression that um, because you're deep in the coaching ranks, I'm a media person, but my impression has always been that the coaches are more like father figures and they take humbrage to their children being screwed with. That's, am I looking at it the wrong way? I think anybody that loves and cares about people mm-hmm. is going to take that personally, right? Like, this is my, like, I look at, as I said earlier, like, this is my family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, you might not see that we're family, but we're family. Mm-hmm. And you're threatening my family. Right. Right. And and we function best when we see each other as family. And that we're willing to, for example, be a lead blocker and lay out and take on that big person. Right on defense, mm-hmm. and take them out of the equation to not get the glory, to let someone else get the glory because of that love and trust and care. And then you want to threaten like family, or you want to create division at the core mm-hmm. because you've created this no win dichotomy. I mean, of course, Tomlin was crying. You you kept your team in the locker room mm-hmm. to spare them from having to make an impossible choice, right? Right. A no win decision. They, you know, you take a knee or you don't take a knee. You're hurting someone and you're you're not standing for something. There's no win in that situation. That's a heartbreak scenario for any person who cares about their team. Will diversity get us through this, you think? Getting back to your book's message? I certainly hope so. But I think it's the unity that comes from diversity. Well said. Yeah, well said. I'm sorry, go ahead. You know what I mean? The unity that comes from diversity and the desire to live with empathy and to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. You know, I have not been pulled over because, you know, for, as many people would say, driving while black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? We've all heard that statement. Right. I've never personally experienced it. But I have felt the pain Mm -hmm. of watching somebody that I love recount a story and an experience. And it's broken my heart. Right? Yes. And so when we have the ability to truly put our own experiences 
a little bit to the side, right? And to say, to, to recognize like that I can't completely understand it because I haven't experienced it. Mm-hmm. But that I can empathize with it because I love you and care for you and your pain becomes like my pain, mm-hmm. even though it's not mine personally. Mm-hmm. Then we see how this is a really big problem. Right? Right. And we see, you know, people getting shot for no reason and we see these things that you you can't as a good human come up with any good rational explanation to take it away. There's nothing that justifies it. Right? Right. You can't see some of these cases and say, Oh yeah, that was perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. It, it's not. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... <laughs> right? And, and and like I said, you know, I've never personally lived it, but I have heard it mm-hmm. through people that I love and been willing enough to listen and empathize with what that life might be like mm-hmm. it's or a, what fear yeah, might be like. It's a scary thing. I mean, I even here, I, I'm in Fayette County and I have to give kudos to the police here uh, because, you know, I can call